I am here to talk about how octopuses aren't aliens, but they're still cool. Um, and I just thought I would ask if any of you have ever heard that octopuses might be aliens. Not that you've thought it yourself, I'm sure, because you're all too smart for that, but maybe like somebody on the internet told you that octopuses might be aliens. Um, so that idea has been around for a really long time, um, which is, here I kind of like to, uh, to credit Bart a little bit with making me think in historical terms, uh, because this idea of did octopuses come from outer space, are octopuses aliens, are aliens octopuses, um, goes back at least to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, whose Martians, as you may recall, were suspiciously tentacular, uh, have often been illustrated very octopus-like um, in format. And uh, not too long after that, in the, at the end of the 1800s, we have Lovecraft coming in in the 20s with the Call of Cthulhu, which is not strictly outer space, but still very um, supra-terrestrial, you might say. Cthulhu um, being the classic cephalopodic god of horror. So I feel like the, both science fiction and fantasy have these deep traditions of using octopuses and squid as as aliens, as inspiration for aliens, and maybe sus making us all suspect that the ones that we have in our oceans might themselves be aliens. They're not. Uh, so you can go home now if you're really tired. But if you want to stay and hear some more, um, you can sometimes hear people asserting that scientists, not science fiction authors, but actual scientists, have said that octopuses are aliens. Um, I should probably do a little, little digression here since I'm not sure everybody has come to my past octopus talks uh, because I do say octopuses and that's weird, right? Uh, like, are a lot of you expecting me to say octopi? It's legit. You can say octopi. I, I used to be super pedantic about it and actually correct people and tell them that octopi would be the plural if the word octopus were in fact Latin. Octopus, octopi. But it's not Latin. It comes from Greek. Um, and the original plural in the ancient Greek would be octopodes. One octopus, several octopodes. Um, so you can all bring that home with you. However, um, it's not even ancient Greek. The word octopus was invented by European scientists long after the ancient Greeks stopped speaking ancient Greek and became modern Greeks. So you can just basically pluralize it however you want. Um, just freedom, uh, whatever you like. Uh, I keep saying octopuses because that's what I do. Um, but however they want to call them, octopuses, octopodes, or octopi, they are not aliens from outer space, despite the fact that Martin Wells, grandson of H.G., who wrote literally the book on octopuses, their biology and behavior, wrote this. The octopus is an alien. He wrote that. That's in the book. Uh, he went on to explain, it is a poikilotherm, never had a dependent childhood, has little or no social life. It may never know what it is to be hungry, simply because it is evidently intelligent and possessed of eyes that look back at us. We should not fall into the trap of supposing we can interpret its behavior in terms of concepts derived from birds or mammals. This animal lives in a very different world from our own. So if you read the entire quote, you can understand that Martin Wells, grandson of H.G., was using the word alien not in an outer space sense, but in an extremely different sense. He's saying that what this animal does, how it senses the world, how it interacts with its environment is alien to us. We can't take the things that it does and interpret them as if it were a mammal or a bird or another vertebrate. Everything that it does is different from everything that we do. And we should keep that in mind, which is a really interesting point. Um, the problem is that it's really the first line that most people remember from this quote. And even um, as recently as 2015, when the first octopus genome was sequenced, one of the lead researchers on that project said the late British zoologist said the octopus is an alien. In this sense, then, our paper describes the first sequenced genome from an alien. So this is the first time I saw headlines exploding around the world because headline writers everywhere rejoice when they get a quote from a cephalopod, from a, from a scientist that is this genius. A quote from a cephalopod is good too, if you can get one. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. Um, but this is, this was just beautiful. So everywhere there were Daily Mirror and um, all sorts of uh, very tabloid publications saying things like the, uh, scientists declare that octopuses are basically aliens. We have alien DNA here on our planet. Um, but they're actually still not aliens. And they're still related to every other form of life on our planet. 
Um, and that would have settled matters, except um, there are these fringe scientists that published an actual paper just a few months ago. Um, it came actually it came out this month in print, but it was published online several months ago, and so everybody picked it up. Um, and it's called The Cause of Cambrian Explosion, Terrestrial or Cosmic, which sounds suitably vague and academic, but within the paper is this actual scientific figure of a squid and a outer space virus somehow... I, I, it doesn't make more sense if I look at it upside down. Uh, figure five, the evolution from squid to octopus is compatible with a suite of genes inserted by extraterrestrial viruses. So this paper that was actually published by scientists, uh, somebody decided they considered them scientists anyway, um, was asserting that octopuses are so weird that they could only exist if viruses from outer space had their genes inserted into squid. Um, which doesn't make sense because octopuses didn't evolve from squid. Uh, an alternative extraterrestrial scenario, discoed, discoosed, uh, is that a population of cryopreserved octopus embryos soft landed en masse from space. So that's cool. I wish that happened. Uh, anyway, this has been very, very thoroughly debunked. Um, the, there was a whole thing. Uh, if you want to read some of the articles where people really delved into the logic or lack thereof behind these claims, Popular Science and, and BuzzFeed News actually both had really lovely, solid ones. Um, it was my PhD advisor, actually, William Gilley, who gave a really nice quote uh, explaining that this paper um, is so badly written and full of misleading statements that he wasn't even sure how it passed peer review. Uh, he also asked whether this was perhaps the April Fool's issue of the journal. Uh, which has been neither confirmed nor denied by anybody, as far as I know. Uh, and octopus genes, as we know, now that the entire genome of one species has been sequenced, do, in fact, sit squarely on the genetic family tree of all life. And that's why they're so cool. So I think we need to kind of let go of this idea of they're so weird they must come from outer space and really celebrate how evolution arrived at something like an octopus over millions and millions of years. This is not the family tree of all life on Earth because that's bigger, but this is... <laughs> awesome. Yes, whoever you are, yes. Cheer those phylogenetic trees because they're great. Um, this is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, phylogenetic trees. Um, this is the cephalopods, which is the group of animals that includes squid and octopus. Ooh, do I have a light? Oh, I do. Up here on the top is squid, octopuses, nautiluses, cuttlefish. All of these are the cephalopods that live today in our neogene oceans. And these are all of the animals that they evolved from and their cousins and their distant cousins and their ancestors going way back to the Cambrian 500 million years ago, twice as old as dinosaurs. I will just note. Um, just a little side note there. And then uh, this is how, where octopuses come in, they're they're squarely there connected to everything else, but I will admit that they are in some ways the weirdest, strangest, and perhaps coolest of the cephalopods. So I'm gonna spend the rest of my talk telling you how they got to be that way, because they evolved from something that looked very much like a snail, and probably behaved very much like a snail. So how did that happen? To get there, we need to think about what it is that makes the modern octopus so amazing. Um, is it the tentacles? They're very cool. Uh, the camouflage, they can blend in with anything. The ink, uh, also very cool. I hear it tastes good on pasta and maybe risotto and maybe ice cream, um, but it's, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, is it their intelligence? I have to say this is what first drew me to octopuses. Uh, their, dare I say it, alien intelligence. The way that their brains work to modify their behavior in response to their environment is amazing. Their individual differences, their distinct personalities, the way that they learn from their environment and from their own past experiences and quite possibly from each other, these things capture us. And the fact is none of them existed back in the Cambrian. The very first cephalopod probably didn't have any of those cool features. What it had instead was a shell. And what was so cool about its shell and made it different from all of the other snails that were oozing around at the time is that its shell was buoyant. Uh, and so this, is, this figure basically describes the origin of the cephalopods. They started out sort of like a 
a snail here, and then they began to make these chambers inside their shell. This is like a cutaway view of a snail down here. Um, and then those chambers, they were able to use a tube to pull the liquid out of the chambers and let gas diffuse in. And once enough gas diffused into the chambers, they became like these little dirigibles, and the gas in their chambers just lifted them up off the seafloor. Uh, and it was it was the first of its kind. There were really no other swimming animals because this was hundreds of millions of years before things like ichthyosaurs, before things like sharks even were around. Uh, and they were the first, even though they were kind of adorable and tiny to begin with, they were still the first swimmers of any substantial size. And once they had this chambered buoyant system, they could get really, really big. Uh, this is a figure that um, is of the largest early cephalopods that had these straight shells. They looked like squids stuffed into shells, basically. Uh, and they were not fast swimmers. <laughs> they did not maneuver around. They were more like these sort of floating death machines because nothing was prepared to look above it for a predator. Um, one uh, paleontological line of argument goes that things like trilobites didn't even have eyes that could look up because they weren't prepared for anything to be above them reaching down with its admittedly slow tentacles to snatch them off the seafloor and devour them. So these guys were actually top dog way back in the Ordovician because there wasn't anything else. There weren't any fish. There weren't anything else going on. They probably did develop those tentacles early on because once you're up in the water column, instead of scooching along on the ground, it becomes really handy to be able to grab your food. Um, but we don't know if they had any camouflage. Probably not because they were stuffed inside shells. We don't know if they had any ink. We certainly don't know if they had any intelligence. So we're still a long way from an octopus. Um, but then what happened is fish did evolve. Fish got big and they got jaws and those jaws could crack shells. And those external shells became kind of problematic because they couldn't maneuver and they couldn't get away from these new predators. And they also couldn't compete with them for food. So a whole group of cephalopods evolved internal shells, and this is a fossil of one of those with its arms out here that had these cool hooks on them. And you see the outline of the soft body here. So it was soft on the outside like a squid, but it still had this heavy chambered shell inside. Solid, not, not heavy, but, but very solid with chambers with gas in them um, and all of the same structure. But by internalizing that shell and growing their body around it, they were able to swim better, maneuver better, escape from fish and compete with fish. And that group was called the coleoids. And it's the coleoid cephalopods that are almost all of the ones you see today. If you go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium to the tentacles exhibit, almost everything in there is a coleoid, except for the chambered nautiluses. They're super weird, but that's a whole different talk. Uh, moving up into the Carboniferous, which is when we start to see these early coleoids, these early ancestors of squid and octopuses, we think they looked more or less like this. They definitely had tentacles, um, and they probably had developed that cool camouflaging skin, at least the beginnings of it, because once you don't have a hard shell to hide in, it becomes really advantageous to blend in with your environment. Um, still no evidence of ink sacs, and hard to find fossil evidence of intelligence. It's just a real trick, so nobody knows. Um, but we are getting into the beginnings of something that's going to eventually turn into an octopus. So we have to jump forward a little bit in time. And remember that even though this looks kind of like a squid, what's inside, it's mostly just skin around a really solid shell. And that really solid shell might still have been too big or might have become too awkward once you had things like fancy sharks and ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and mosasaurs evolving because those things... Oh, sorry. This is a fossil shark ancestor, a Condorthian shark ancestor, and this in its stomach area is just hundreds and hundreds of shells of dead coleoids, <laughs> just, just lots and lots of them. So clearly they were being eaten in large numbers. Um, it has been theorized that this particular shark ancestor died because it had too many heavy shells in its belly, um, but that's not really much comfort to all of the dead coleoids, so too bad for them. Um, and that shell became smaller and smaller. The fossil record shows us that there was clearly selective pressure for reducing the shell. Um, the fancy term is decalcified, but what that, all that means is that instead of a hard calcium shell like a snail shell, it became a softer, flexible, what's called a pen. 
or a gladius. And this actually happened both in ancestral squid and in ancestral octopuses. And so the fossil record is full of these softer, not quite shells that um, nobody really knows whether they belong to ancient octopuses or ancient squid. And there's papers and papers and reams of space devoted to arguing about it. But for our purposes here, we don't need to know. We just need to know that by the time we're getting into Triassic, Jurassic, the beginnings of dinosaur time, the oceans are full of both ancient octopus ancestors and ancient squid ancestors. And they look a lot more squiggly and ill-defined, just like you'd expect an octopus to look today if you smashed it flat in rock and fossilized it. Uh, it, like nothing, basically. But they definitely had uh, arms and tentacles. They're certainly doing some significant camouflaging at this point because the oceans are crawling, well, swimming with predators. And there's just no way they would have survived if they were not doing some fancy camouflage to blend in. We also have the first fossil ink sacs during this time in the Jurassic, which is quite cool. Ink actually fossilizes really well. And there's at least one um, fossil of an ancient cephalopod from this time period where the ink was reconstituted. They, they got it out of the rock and mixed it with water and then used it to draw a picture of the squid. It's very cool. Uh, it's a good, so there's a picture of it in my book, in fact. A little plug there. Uh, but we still don't know how intelligent they were because there's no way to find out. But we do know that they probably continued to get more small, um, in terms of their internal shell. And that was a really good thing because that, that large flexible pen um, is useful if you're swimming fast, like a squid. And that's why modern squid, if you ever, if you remember dissecting one in your high school biology class, or if you've ever cleaned one out to prepare it, they still have this long flexible pen inside uh, because it helps them swim fast. It gives their muscles something to move against. But if you're not trying to swim fast or be particularly buoyant, then it's not very useful at all. And octopuses were not trying to do either of those things. The evolutionary pressures on octopuses pushed them more and more towards high hiding, oozing, fitting through very small spaces. And so we get the early octopods, the early members of the group that has octopuses in it, through this shrinkage of their internal shell to the point that modern ones have barely anything at all. Uh, so now we're in the Cretaceous, we're at the very end of the heyday of dinosaurs, and while Triceratops and Tyrannosaurs are doing their thing um, up on land, we're much more interested in what's happening in the oceans, of course, right? Um, and you get these beautiful specimens of early octopuses, like Paleoctopus, um, done by this artist, Franz Anthony, who recently did a whole bunch of these ancient cephalopods beautifully. This is an interesting little octopus that still has fins. Um, most modern octopuses that you see do not have fins, but a few of the ones that live in the deep sea do. And the ones that have fins um, actually still have these little wings for their fins to attach to. So these little winglets that are the last little vestiges of a shell inside their body. Um, and they're, they're beautiful creatures. So by the time um, it's late Cretaceous, we've got all of the basic ingredients, except for we don't know about that really cool intelligence that we so love in the modern octopuses. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and jump to modern times, where we have not only our modern octopus, but the ones that still have the fins. We have vampire squid, which I have a plush one of in the back, and you're welcome to come and hug it. We no obligation to buy a book. Just just hug the vampire squid. Um, squid and cuttlefish, all of our moderns. And of course, the octopuses that so mesmerize us when we go to aquariums, uh, when we go diving in the ocean, or if you just see them in the tide pools, they're arm full, tentacle full. They blend in with anything and everything. They have this crazy ink that they squirt when they get really alarmed. And they're clearly very complex in their behavior. Each one is different. Uh, they're capable of learning. They're capable of interacting with each other and with members of other species. They'll recognize different humans who take care of them or don't take care of them and make their preference known. And so these are really just quite the most amazing animals in the world, in my opinion. And I think it's just so great that they're related to us, that they share so much of their DNA with us and with all of the other life forms on Earth. And we can really look at them and learn a lot about 
how evolution works, about how brains work, because every other animal that we can think of that we study a complex brain in, whether it's a dog or a pig or even a crow, those brains all evolved from the same kind of brain, a vertebrate brain, an ancestor that had a backbone like us. But octopus brains didn't. They evolved along a separate trajectory from a common ancestor that didn't really have anything like a brain at all. So it's such an exciting thing to look at how does pain work in these animals? Do they experience it? How does learning work? Learning that evolved in a totally different way. Um, so anyway, I can just go on and on about octopuses, but they're rad. Um, and why do they keep reminding us of aliens? I would say it's because we look at them and they're so different from us, they're the closest we can find on our planet to aliens, and so we keep modeling our aliens off of octopuses. It's a bit of a positive feedback loop. Um, you may recall these guys. I'm sure you all know what movie this is from. Yes, of course, it's Galaxy Quest, <laughs> the best aliens. Um, until uh, this film came out, and I was pretty excited about these guys. Did you all see Arrival? Um, I, I love it. I love that cephalopods keep inspiring aliens. Um, and we don't need to believe that they're actually aliens to look at them and feel like they can inform us not only about how evolution on our planet works, but about how it might work elsewhere in the galaxy. So, so I'm all for continuing to model aliens off of octopuses and other cephalopods. And if you want more about evolution on our planet, there's my book. Um, I've got some more copies in the back, and you can look it up online. Uh, there's an ebook if you want it, and there's a Japanese edition if you want that. Um, and if you're more into the alien side of things, there's a anthology coming up, a book called Putting the Science in Fiction, to which I have contributed several articles about how to use real-life ocean science and real-life invertebrates to inspire your writing of fiction. And with that, I will thank all of you and Bart and the rickshaw stop and DJ, everybody. Thank you. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.